The dictionary defines paradise as a place where one expects to find a perfect situation, perfect happiness. This is why heaven is referred to as paradise in Luke 23 verse 43 where Jesus promises the thief on the cross that his troubles and his sufferings in this world would soon be over because on that day he would be in paradise. I've noticed that a lot of people think of the church in these terms. That once they are in the church, they've entered a perfect place, a place where there's no discord, no trouble, no, no, no suffering, you know, paradise on earth. And of course these people become very discouraged and even quit the faith when they discover right here in the church, this supposed perfect place, jealousy, meanness, immorality, dishonesty, incompetence, all kinds of foolishness in the Lord's church at times. The big surprise comes when we read the New Testament and we discover that it has always been this way. The apostles were constantly dealing with problems and problem people in the church. They rarely write about problem people in the world. They write about problem people in the church. So there's always been trouble in paradise. That's the title of my sermon, Trouble in Paradise. There's always been trouble in paradise, so to speak, because people don't understand that the church on earth is forgiven for sin, but still deals with the effects of sin on a daily basis. Now the same church in heaven will also be forgiven for sin, of course, but will no longer have to deal with its effects ever again. So there it'll be perfect, really perfect. Now Jesus understood this difference and for this reason, He left us with certain principles to help us deal with the trouble that we experience in paradise here on earth while we wait to enter the paradise prepared for us in heaven. And so in Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 to 35, we recognize five of the principles that Jesus gave us for avoiding trouble in paradise. So here they are, the five principles to help us deal with trouble in paradise. Principle number one, humble yourself. Humble yourself. Verses one to six, he says at that time, or the, the word says, at that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter uh, the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones to believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him to have a heavy millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. See to it that you do not despise one of these little ones, as he said, for I say to you that their angels in heaven continually see the face of my Father who is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which uh, was lost. What do you think, if any man has a hundred sheep and one of them has gone astray, does he not leave the ninety-nine on the mountain and go and search for the one that is straying? If it turns out that he finds it, truly I say to you, he rejoices over it more than over the ninety-nine which have not gone astray. So it is not the will of your Father who is in heaven that one of these little ones perish. So I repeat again, when there's trouble in paradise, one of the principles to counter that type of trouble is humble yourself. You know, ego is the big problem in the world and a lot of times the problem in the church. There's no room for you and a big ego in paradise because egos are fragile, aren't they? I mean, they're easily bruised, they want their own way, they serve themselves only, they'll compromise many times, they'll compromise to preserve self. So Jesus says that the only way to be great, if you wish, to be honored, by God, because that's the only way to receive honor in paradise. God is the one who gives it to you. The only way to receive honor is to be like a child. Let go your ego. 
Jesus also warns those who would destroy the innocent because they are easy to destroy because they're like children. He warns these proud wolves that their judgment will be severe. So you want to avoid trouble in paradise? Humble yourself. If you're in a situation where there's problems and you find yourself in problems or conflict in the church, ask yourself, is this my pride working here? Has my ego been bruised? Is this trouble caused by an overinflated sense of self and importance? We want to avoid trouble in the church. We need to humble ourselves. Principle number two, don't ignore the judgment. Don't ignore the judgment. Verse seven, he says, woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks, for it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling block comes. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than to have two hands or two feet and be cast into eternal fire. If your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be cast into the fiery hell. So principle number two, do not ignore the judgment. Take seriously what God says about judgment. You know, people do all kinds of things because they don't really believe that God is going to punish them. Jesus specifically and repeatedly warns that judgment will be sure and will be terrible. How much more restraint we would have, what greater care we would take in the way that we treat other people in and out of the church if we were sure that God will call us to account for what we've done. Imagine, imagine if you will, having to answer for every mean and selfish, never mind word, but thought, would any of us really want all of our thoughts revealed? So people who do things that disrupt and destroy the church, they don't realize that there will be a terrible price to pay for the trouble that they cause in the earthly paradise. And of course the end result is that they won't enter the heavenly paradise. So if we want to avoid trouble in the church, we need to take seriously God's, uh, Jesus' admonitions concerning the judgment itself. Principle number three, deal with troublemakers. So you know, realize that there'll be a judgment, but also deal with the troublemakers. Verse 15, I'm kind of jumping around, but it's all in the same context here. Verse 15, he says, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you've won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if uh, he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that if two, uh, if two of you agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three have gathered uh, together in my name, I am there in their midst. You know, Christians, I, the ones that I've known, usually don't like confrontation. They think you know, forgetting about problems and ignoring troublemakers many times is an effective way of solving problems. This method usually creates bitterness and leads to more trouble because those who create problems are left to do more damage to other people. So please, uh, peace rather, doesn't just happen. You have to make it happen. You have to create the peace. You have to work at maintaining peace. And sometimes, sometimes, the work that we need to do to maintain the peace is to confront those who are disrupting the peace. Very important. Jesus provides us with instructions. You know, this is a really, a very rare instance here where you know, Jesus actually gives a one to do this, then do that, then do that. You know, usually he's talking about principles, larger principles, but here he's actually giving us the details on how to deal with trouble, uh, conflict in the, in, the, in the church, telling us what to do. 
And yet, even though he gives a step-by-step -step process on how to deal with certain types of conflict, this passage here is the most ignored teaching in the church today. It's one of the things we do the least. Now hopefully we, we rarely do it because there's never anybody causing trouble in church, but you and I know that you know, <laughs> that's not true. When there are problems with people, we seem to do everything else instead of what Jesus says. If someone offends us, we hold a grudge. Instead of going to them and saying, you know what you said or what you did, this, this hurt me, am I understanding correctly? Did you say this about, you know what I'm saying? We don't do that, we just, we just hold a burning grudge. Or we gossip about the person, you know what I call, you know, we form a posse. We get our people together. We get those who will agree with us about this other person here and what that person has done. Or worse still, we plot revenge. You know, in our heart we're saying, it's okay, I'm not saying anything right now, but your turn will come. We do that. And yet the Lord not only tells us how to deal with troublemakers, He guarantees us that if we do things His way in the paradise here on earth, He will honor and support these things in the paradise that He rules in heaven. And so if we want to avoid, you know, if we, if we want to avoid trouble in paradise, our paradise, this paradise, we need to deal with people who cause trouble and we need to deal with them in the way that Jesus teaches us. Principle number four, forgiveness is the standard. Forgiveness is the standard. Verse 21 this time, then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him, up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but, if, uh, but, uh, but up to 70 times seven. So in this verse, Peter aspires to be you know, the most gracious that the law demanded of him. For the custom among devout Jews at that time was that you forgave up to seven times. And so Peter's saying, well, I, you know, I, he hears what Jesus is saying, so all right. Shall I forgive you know, up to seven times, that many times? And here Jesus establishes a new standard for this, this idea of forgiveness in paradise. And that is unlimited forgiveness. That 70 times seven is another way of saying unlimited forgiveness. Every time they ask you for forgiveness, you offer it eight times, 10 times, 15 times. In a place where there are offenses and mistakes and weakness and stupidity and sin and ignorance, there's, there's going to be trouble, that's for sure. You can't, you, can't, <laughs> you can't attempt to create a family relationship between three or four or five hundred people and there not be somebody somewhere on some day get offended by what somebody says. I mean, you have your own family. You might be mom and dad and two kids, and even in that family of four, there's trouble. <laughs> Imagine you've got a family of 400. The only way to deal with unlimited sin is to provide unlimited opportunity for forgiveness. The feature that makes the church paradise on earth is that it is the only place on earth where forgiveness is always available regardless of the sin and regardless of the number. That's one of the reasons why being in church, being of the church, being part of the church, being related to the, why it's a paradise, why we love being with church people. Because we don't operate in the same way that the world operates. The most attractive thing about the church is not its building or its programs or the eloquence of its ministers, but the fact that sinners can always find forgiveness in this place. That's the thing that appeals to people. Forgiveness is not only the standard, it's the goal of every dispute. It's the goal of every offense. In paradise, we don't go to win the argument, we go to win the peace. 
in paradise, we don't, we're not looking for justice or revenge. We're looking for forgiveness. Either receiving forgiveness for what we've done and searching for that to another, or the opportunity to give forgiveness to someone who is, who's hurt us. If you're in a situation where you're you know, knocking heads with someone in this place, what you're looking for is an opening to offer forgiveness. Not an opening to you know, destroy the person. You want the opportunity to offer forgiveness so that you can you know, again go back to the good relationship that you had. Principle number five, all in this passage, dealing with troublemakers in paradise. There is no mercy without mercy. There is no mercy without mercy. This time beginning in verse 23. Jesus says the following. For this reason the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he had begun to settle them, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. But since he did not have the means to repay, his lord, uh, to repay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, along with his wife and children and all that he had, and repayment to be made. So the slave fell to the ground and prostrated himself before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will repay you everything. And the Lord of that slave felt compassion and released him and forgave him the debt. But that slave went out and found one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And he seized him and began to choke him, saying, Pay back what you owe. So his fellow slave fell to the ground and began to plead with him, saying, Have patience with me and I will repay you. But he was unwilling and went and threw him in prison until he should pay back what was owed. So when his fellow slaves saw that what had happened, they were deeply grieved and came and reported to their Lord all that had happened. Then summoning him, his Lord said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not also have had mercy on your fellow slave in the same way that I had mercy on you? And his Lord moved with anger, handed him over to the torturers until he should repay all that was owed him. My heavenly Father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. And one of the things about this passage, you know, the difference between 10,000 talents and a few hundred denarii. A few hundred denarii was a day or two of wages. 10,000 talents was like millions of dollars. You know, there was a tremendous difference in the amounts here. Now the key verse in this parable is verse 33, where he says, should you not also have had mercy? He should have had mercy not because he felt like it or because the other slave deserved it or because he could afford it. All of these are good reasons to have mercy, but not the correct one in this passage. He should have had mercy because he himself had received mercy. That's what the individual, or that's what Jesus is saying here about this particular individual. You know, we think we deserve to be in paradise sometimes, and we begin to wonder if other people deserve to be here too. We think we belong in paradise and start making rules about who belongs here too. We think we've earned our paradise at times and we start checking to make sure everybody else has paid their way in too. Jesus has news for us with this parable. We are here because of mercy. Whether we grew up in paradise or whether we just arrived in paradise, the thing that got us here was God's mercy and the thing that keeps us here now and forevermore is the mercy we show to other people. No mercy without mercy. And so these principles, you know, they help us deal with the trouble that we experience at times in the church, in this paradise here on earth. It's so sad to see people quit the church or criticize the church because it's not in its heavenly state here on earth. Not yet anyways, and it'll never be like that. What makes us think the church here on earth will be sinless while it's here on earth? We can avoid this loss of brethren 
We can get a handle on some of our own problems, and even here in Choctaw, for example, by applying these principles to ourselves. So let's review, shall we? Let's check our pride at the door, shall we? Let's do that. The world is full of wars and trouble because people are proud. Let's remember that what pleases God is humility and gentleness and becoming less so others can become more. This is pleasing to God. That we win the argument, that's not what God is looking for. He's looking for a humble heart. Let's also get a handle on our sins, shall we? If you realize that you're a liar, or a bully, or you're impure, or you're stubborn, or greedy, or lazy, or a slave to something, whatever, fill in the blank, do something about it. <laughs> Some people think just acknowledging their sin is doing something about it. I see that phenomenon quite often. People continue to think that because they're very honest about acknowledging their sin, that's all they got to do. Well, I'm honest about it, I'm acknowledging I'm this or I'm that. Well, that's a good first step, but just acknowledging your sin just me acknowledging my sin, that doesn't just take care of the sin. That's the first step in dealing with my sin. I've got to do other things. You know, if God promises judgment and God promises punishment, He means it. Don't ignore His warning. Let's remember also, hang on a second, Let's, let's get real with each other, shall we? If you have a problem with somebody, stop pretending everything is okay to their face while talking about them behind their backs. And you know what, just in case you're thinking, whoa, what? did something happen this week? Is he preaching? No. You know, there's no name on the bullet here. I'm not aiming at, you know, I'm not preaching this, hoping that one person will, you know, if I have a problem with one person, I'm certainly not going to preach the 300 people just to talk to one person. I will go to that person. I will go to that person. No, I'm saying let's get real with each other because that promotes spiritual growth. And so if you have a problem with somebody, don't pretend. Fix it. Go to that person. You know, God doesn't guarantee that everybody will get along all the time, but He does expect that we will try, and He does demand that we be honest with each other. You know, when I say, you know, liars, if lying is your problem, I'm not talking about your lying about your age or your weight. <laughs> I'm talking about you're not telling the truth to the person you're having a problem with. You're telling that person everything is fine, you're giving them a hug and everything, but on the inside, you're, you're, you're hating them. That's a lie. Tell the truth. Another reminder, let's just let it go, shall we? Are you keeping a grudge? Are you nursing a bruised feeling? Are you saving up insults from other people? What good is all this doing for you? The best satisfaction you will ever feel will not come from justice. It will always come from forgiveness. In the world, everybody wants justice. They go to court to get money if you know, somebody said something that they don't like. But even if they get money, there's still not a satisfying thing inside. But in paradise, we're not, we're not looking for justice. Are you kidding me? If we demand justice from somebody else, then God is going to demand justice for us. We're going to be in a bad place. No, we want, we, want, we want to arrive at forgiveness. Forgiveness towards ourselves, forgiveness towards, towards someone else. Whatever it is, I'm exhorting you, I'm encouraging you, let it go. Just let it go. And then, of course, let's be a place, let's be a place of mercy, shall we? What do we want to be known for? Great singing? Great facility? 
great programs, great youth group. I mean, yeah, sure. These are all great and they're all necessary, but you know what? I want us to be known for our mercy. I, I want that to be the lead characteristic that people will know about us as a, as a group of people. If you come here, you find mercy here. You know, the Choctaw Church of Christ should be a place where sinners are welcome because you know what? That's all we got. <laughs> so we, we, that's all we have here is sinners. We don't have anything else. I was sorely tempted to just put that on the billboard, believe it or not. Just <laughs> sorely tempted to just put just sinners are welcome at the Church of Christ, period. Just put that on the billboard. And maybe we will at some point. Of course, the billboard being right over a bar. <laughs> I thought we were opening ourselves up for a lawsuit. So, and I wonder, as I drove by, as Lisa and I drove by the bar where the sign is, happens to be, there were still cars parked in front of it at 4.30 on a Sunday afternoon, so I guess it hasn't uh, stopped anybody from going in and having their beverage on a Sunday afternoon. You know, there's always going to be trouble in paradise here on earth. But our hope is that if we put these principles in action in our personal and in our congregational lives, we're going to be able to mitigate the trouble here and eventually go to that paradise where no trouble or sorrow can ever touch us again. And believe me, one of the things that I personally am looking forward to in heaven no sin, oh man, I'm looking forward to that. People say, oh, you know, I won't be hungry, or you know, what, my, my sore back won't be sore anymore. Yeah, that's all good. You know, but I'm really looking forward to being in a place where there's no sin at all. No sin, no guilt. That'll be just a wonderful place to be able to deal with other beings without any sin whatsoever. You know, when I was 30 years old and I was looking for meaning and direction in my life, I saw a small ad in the local paper, and I've told you this story many times. That little ad in the local papers actually said, sinners are welcome at the Church of Christ. That's the ad that the, the preacher, Jim Metter, put in that little newspaper, and then he wrote a column about how Jesus forgives sinners. That ad told me that this church would welcome me, the sinner. And so I went to that church and I listened to what was being said. And a few months later, I, I, was, I was baptized. Sinners are not welcome in many places, but they are always welcome in the Lord's church. And so if you're a sinner, and if you need to come to Jesus Christ for forgiveness or restoration, then I encourage you, come forward become part of this paradise here on earth and stay with us until we enter that other paradise that our dear brother in Christ has entered uh, just recently and all those who will go before us will enter as well. If you need to come to Christ this evening, please come as we stand and as we sing.